Chapter Eleven. In a word, do you want to know how they do not live long? See how eager they are to live long. Decrepit old men beg in their prayers for the addition of a few more years. They pretend that they are younger than they are. They comfort themselves with a falsehood, and are as pleased to deceive themselves as if they deceived fate at the same time. But when at last some infirmity has reminded them of their mortality, in what terror do they die, feeling that they are being dragged out of life and not merely leaving it? They cry out that they have been fools because they have not really lived, and that they will live henceforth in leisure if only they escape from this illness. Then at last they reflect how uselessly they have striven for things which they did not enjoy, and how all their toil has gone for nothing. But for those whose life is passed remote from all business, why should it not be ample? None of it is assigned to another; none of it is scattered in this direction and that; none of it is committed to fortune; none of it perishes from neglect; none of it is subtracted by wasteful giving; none of it is unused. The whole of it, so to speak, yields income. And so, however small the amount of it, it is abundantly sufficient, and therefore. Whenever his last day shall come, the wise man will not hesitate to go to meet death with steady step. Chapter Twelve. Perhaps you ask whom I would call the engrossed. There is no reason for you to suppose that I mean only those whom the dogs that have at length been let in drive out from the law court. Those whom you see either gloriously crushed in their own crowd of followers, or scornfully in someone else's. Those whom social duties call forth from their own homes to bump them against someone else's doors, or whom the praetor's hammer keeps busy in seeking gain that is disreputable and that will one day fester, even the leisure of some men is engrossed, in their villa or on their couch, in the midst of solitude. Although they have withdrawn from all others, they are themselves the source of their own worry. We should say that these are living not in leisure but in busy idleness. Would you say that that man is at leisure who arranges with finical care his Corinthian bronzes, that the mania of a few makes costly, and spends the greater part of each day upon rusty bits of copper, who sits in a public wrestling place, for to our shame if we labor with vices that are not even Roman, watching the wrangling of lads, who sorts out the herds of his pack mules into pairs of the same age and color, who feeds all the newest athletes? Tell me, would you say that those men or at leisure who pass many hours at the barber's while they are being stripped of whatever grew out the night before, while a solemn debate is held over each separate hair, while either disarranged locks are restored to their place or thinning ones drawn from this side and that towards the forehead, how angry they get if the barber has been a bit too careless, just as if he were shearing a real man, how they flare up if any of their mane is lopped off, if any of it lies out of order. If it does not all fall into its proper ringlets, who of these would not rather have the state disordered than his hair? Who is not more concerned to have his head trim rather than safe? Who would not rather be well barbered than upright? Would you say that these are at leisure who are occupied with the comb and the mirror? And what of those who are engaged in composing, hearing, and learning songs while they twist the voice, whose best and simplest movement of nature designed to be straightforward, into the meanderings of some indolent tune? Who are always snapping their fingers as they beat time to some song they have in their head, who are overheard humming a tune when they have been summoned to serious, often melancholy matters. These have not leisure but idle occupation, and their banquets, heaven knows, I cannot reckon among their unoccupied hours, since I see how anxiously they set out their silver plate, how diligently they tie up the tunics of their pretty slave boys, how breathlessly they watch to see in what style the wild boar issues from the hands of the cook. With what speed, at a given signal, smooth-faced boys hurry in to perform their duties, with what skill the birds are carved into portions all according to rule, how carefully unhappy little lads wipe up the spittle of drunkards. By such means they seek the reputation of being fastidious and elegant, and to such an extent do their evils follow them into all the privacies of life, that they can neither eat nor drink without ostentation. And I would not count these among the leisured class either. The men who have themselves borne hither and thither in a sedan chair and a litter, and are punctual at the hours for their rides as if it were unlawful to omit them, who are reminded by someone else when they must bathe, when they must swim, when they must dine, 
so enfeebled are they by the excessive lassitudes of a pampered mind that they cannot find out by themselves whether they are hungry. I heard that one of these pampered people, provided you can call it pampering to unlearn the habit of human life, when he had been lifted by hands from the bath and placed in his sedan chair, said questioningly, Am I now seated? Do you think that this man, who does not know whether he is sitting, knows whether he is alive, whether he sees, whether he is at leisure? I find it hard to say whether I pity him more if he really did not know, or if he pretended not to know this. They really are subject to forgetfulness of many things, but they also pretend forgetfulness of many. Some vices delight them as being proofs of their prosperity. It seems the part of a man who is very lowly and despicable to know what he is doing. After this, imagine that the mimes fabricate many things to make mock of luxury. In very truth, they pass over more than they invent. And such a multitude of unbelievable vices has come forth in this age, so clever in this one direction, that by now we can charge the mimes with neglect. To think that there is any one who is so lost in luxury that he takes another's word as to whether he is sitting down. This man, then, is not at leisure. You must apply to him a different term. He is sick. Nay, he is dead. That man is at leisure who has also a perception of his leisure. But this other who is half alive, who, in order that he may know the postures of his own body, needs someone to tell him, how can he be the master of any of his time? Chapter 13 It would be tedious to mention all the different men who have spent the whole of their life over chess or ball or the practice of baking their bodies in the sun. They are not unoccupied, whose pleasures are made a busy occupation. For instance, no one will have any doubt that those are laborious triflers who spend their time on useless literary problems, of whom even among the Romans there is now a great number. It was once a foible confined to the Greeks to inquire into what number of rowers Ulysses had, whether the Iliad or the Odyssey was written first, whether moreover they belonged to the same author, and various other matters of this stamp, which, if you keep them to yourself, in no way pleasure your secret soul, and if you publish them, make you seem more of a bore than a scholar. But now this vain passion for learning useless things has assailed the Romans also. In the last few days I heard someone telling who was the first Roman general to do this or that. Duilius was the first who won a naval battle. Curius Dentalus was the first who had elephants led in his triumph. Still these matters, even if they add nothing to real glory, are nevertheless concerned with signal services to the state. There will be no profit in such knowledge. Nevertheless, it wins our attention by reason of the attractiveness of an empty subject. We may excuse also those who inquire into this, who first induced the Romans to go on board ship. It was Claudius, and this was the very reason he was surnamed Caudex because among the ancients a structure formed by joining together several boards was called a codex, which also the tablets of the law are called codices, and in the ancient fashion boats that carry provisions up the Tiber are even today called codiceriae. Doubtless this too may have some point. The fact that Valerius Corvinus was the first to conquer Messana, and was the first of the family of the Valeri to bear the surname Messana, because he had transferred the name of the conquered city to himself and was later called Masala, after the gradual corruption of the name in popular speech. Perhaps you will permit someone to be interested also in this, the fact that Lucius Sulla was the first to exhibit loosed lions in the circus, though at other times they were exhibited in chains, and that javelin throwers were sent by King Bacchus to dispatch them. And doubtless this too may find some excuse. But does it serve any useful purpose to know that Pompey was the first to exhibit the slaughter of eighteen elephants in the circus? pitting criminals against them in a mimic battle? He, a leader of the state, and one who, according to report, was conspicuous among the leaders of old for the kindness of his heart, thought it a notable kind of spectacle to kill human beings after a new fashion. Do they fight to the death? That is not enough. Are they torn to pieces? That is not enough. Let them be crushed by animals of monstrous bulk. Better would it be that these things pass into oblivion, lest hereafter some all-powerful man should learn them, and be jealous of an act that was nowise human. Oh, what blindness does great prosperity cast upon our minds! When he was casting so many troops of wretched human beings to wild beasts born under a different sky, when he was proclaiming a war between creatures so ill-matched, when he was shedding so much blood before the eyes of the Roman people, 
who itself was soon to be forced to shed more, he then believed that he was beyond the power of nature. But later this same man, betrayed by Alexandrine treachery, offered himself to the dagger of the vilest slave, and then at last discovered what an empty boast his surname was. But to return to the point from which I have digressed, and to show that some people bestow useless pains upon these same matters, the man I mentioned related that Metellus, when he triumphed after his victory over the Carthaginians in Sicily, was the only one of all Romans who had caused a hundred and twenty captured elephants to be led before his car, that Sulla was the last of the Romans who extended the Pomerium, which in old times was customary to extend after the acquisition of Italian, but never of provincial territory. It is more profitable to know this than that Mount Aventine, according to him, is outside the Pomerium for one of two reasons, either because that was the place to which the plebeians had seceded, or because the birds had not been favorable when Remus took his auspices on that spot, and in turn countless other reports that are either crammed with falsehood or are of the same sort. For though you grant that they tell these things in good faith, though they pledge themselves for the truth of what they write, still whose mistakes will be made fewer by such stories? Whose passions will they restrain? Whom will they make more brave? Whom more just? Whom more noble-minded? My friend Fabianus used to say that at times he was doubtful whether it was not better not to apply oneself to any studies than to become entangled in these. Chapter 14 Of all men, they alone are at leisure who take time for philosophy. They alone really live, for they are not content to be good guardians of their own lifetime only. They annex ever age to their own. All the years that have gone o'er them are an addition to their store. Unless we are most ungrateful, all those men, glorious fashioners of holy thoughts, were born for us. For us they have prepared a way of life. By other men's labors we are led to the sight of things most beautiful, that have been wrested from the darkness and brought into light. From no age are we shut out. We have access to all ages, and if it is our wish, by greatness of mind, to pass beyond the narrow limits of human weakness, there is a great stretch of time through which we may roam. We may argue with Socrates, we may doubt with Carnadius, find peace with Epicurus, overcome human nature with the Stoics, exceed it with the Cynics. Since nature allows us to enter into fellowship with every age, why should we not turn from this paltry and fleeting span of time and surround ourselves with all our soul to the past, which is boundless, which is eternal, which we share with our betters? Those who rush about in the performance of social duties, who give themselves and others no rest, when they have fully indulged their madness, when they have every day crossed everybody's threshold and have left no open door unvisited, when they have carried around their venal greeting to houses that are very far apart, out of a city so huge and torn by such varied desires, how few will they be able to see? How many will there be who either from sleep or self-indulgence or rudeness will keep them out? How many who, when they have tortured them with long waiting, will rush by, pretending to be in a hurry? How many will avoid passing out through a hall that is crowded with clients, and will make their escape through some concealed door as if it were not more discourteous to deceive than to exclude? How many, still half asleep and sluggish from last night's debauch, scarcely lifting their lips in the midst of a most insolent yawn, manage to bestow on yonder poor wretches, who break their own slumber in order to wait on that of another, the right name only after it has been whispered to them a thousand times. But we may fairly say that they alone are engaged in the true duties of life who shall wish to have Zeno, Pythagoras, Democritus, and all the other high priests of liberal studies, and Aristotle, and Theophrastus, and their most intimate friends every day. No one of these will be not at home, no one of these will fail to have his visitor leave more happy and more devoted to himself than when he came. No one of these will allow any one to leave him with empty hands. All mortals can meet them by night or day. Chapter 15 No one of these will force you to die, but all will teach you how to die. No one of these will wear out your years, but each will add his own years to yours. Conversations with no one of these will bring you to peril. The friendship of none will endanger your life, the courting of none will tax your purse. From them you will take whatever you wish, it will be no fault of theirs if you do not draw the utmost that you can desire. What happiness, what a fair old age awaits him who has offered himself as a client to these. 
He will have friends from whom he may seek counsel on matters great and small, whom he may consult every day about himself, from whom he may hear truth without insult, praise without flattery, and after whose likeness he may fashion himself. We are wont to say that it was not in our power to choose the parents whom fell to our lot, that they have been given to men by chance, yet we may be the sons of whomever we will. Households there are of noblest intellects. Choose the one into which you wish to be adopted. You will inherit not merely their name, but even their property, which there will be no need to guard in a mean or niggardly spirit. The more persons you share it with, the greater it will become. These will open to you the path to immortality, and will raise you to a height from which no one is cast down. This is the only way of prolonging mortality, nay, of turning it into immortality. Honors, monuments, all that ambition has commanded by decrees or reared in works of stone, quickly sink to ruin. There is nothing that the lapse of time does not tear down and remove. But the works which philosophy has consecrated cannot be harmed. No age will destroy them, no age reduce them. The following and each succeeding age will but increase the reverence for them, since envy works upon what is close at hand, and things that are far off we are more free to admire. The life of the philosopher, therefore, has wide range, and he is not confined by the same bounds that shut others in. He alone is freed from the limitations of the human race. All ages serve him as if a god. Has some time passed by? This he embraces by recollection. Is time present? This he uses. Is it still to come? This he anticipates. He makes his life long by combining all things into one.